Hey guys, Ron here. I'm having to start over again. I just lost five minutes. I had a technical malfunction. I'm out here today. I've been here at night, but I'm out here today in front of the condominium where the infamous murder of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson happened. I don't think I've ever actually filmed this during the day. And I want to tell you, I'm using this sort of as a backdrop and this neighborhood because I want to tell you the story of what happened from apparently the story of what happened from OJ's point of view really because I'll use the like I said I'm going to use the neighborhood and the condo as a backdrop but I find it absolutely fascinating OJ's book which was ghost written but OJ's book if I did it wrote it in 2006 I actually bought it in 2006 it was his side of the story a lot of girls jogging by here it's a popular spot uh, it was supposedly his side of the story, the whole relationship up until the time of the murders, in which he includes a chapter, which everybody, including myself, was salivating to get to, chapter six, in which O.J. hypothetically describes how the murders would have happened if he, in fact, had committed them. He also added an element that not only was he there and did it, but he had a mysterious friend called Charlie that was with him the whole time. So... I'm going to tell you what led up to it in OJ's words, what he said from If I Did It, which was later acquired by the Goldman family. They changed the title to I Did It. And they, of course, didn't want OJ to profit from, uh, from any of the proceeds of that, which he didn't, as far as I know. So let's start out. That's Bundy there. I had to actually get off of Bundy. Oh, oh my God. That's Bundy there. I had to get off of Bundy because there was so much traffic. It's just nonstop. I almost got hit crossing the street. And uh, unlike June 12, 1994, when it was apparently very, very quiet, in fact, the neighbor said you could hear a pin drop. So this is the alleyway, and those are the condos right there, with the red tile roof. The, I'm going to show you the exterior, I'm going to show you the front entrance in a minute, but these condos have a gate that OJ claims the gate was not working properly, so he's able to push his way through the gate on June 12, 1994, in his hypothetical explanation. He also claims that Ron Goldman quickly followed him and also pushed the gate open, that the locking mechanism wasn't working. Now, the front of the condo, 875, the address has been removed, and the front of that particular unit has been reconfigured, reconstructed, so no one knows exactly which one, well, some, some of you do, was the exact one, but I'll show you, you can get a look at the gates and the patios. So I'm gonna tell you what OJ claims in If I Did It. This is not an endorsement. I'm not gonna tell you too many of my opinions on this. And I, I certainly, one thing I don't do in my videos, one thing I don't do is judge. There's a lot of vlogs out there, the horrible crime, the horrible, this horrible monster. I don't judge, I'm just gonna tell you the facts. Or I'm just gonna tell you, and we can all speculate on things, but, um, I'm just going to tell you based on what the subject of my video is. And today the subject is OJ, what OJ says happened hypothetically, including what he claims really happened. Unfortunately, we don't have Nicole's words, but what happened from 1992, that two year period to 1994, the night of the murders. So this is, look at all the traffic on Bundy. Now it's the middle of the day. But it's hard to believe that on that Sunday evening at 10 something at night, it was, in fact, like I said, the neighbor said it was unusually eerily quiet. All right, so I love, I've always loved this house with all the bamboo here. So, like I said, this has been reconfigured. 875 is gone, they've changed the address. But you can get an idea here of the patios. Like, here's the patio of 871. Can you imagine if they had surveillance and video everywhere, CCTV cameras and everything like they do now in back in 94? I was in quite a volatile relationship myself with an old girlfriend in 1994 when these murders committed. As a matter of fact, my old girlfriend died uh, in a very 
violent way, obviously not by me, but in a guy, from a guy that she was seeing subsequent. It was really tra tragic and terrible, and uh, we were not speaking anymore at that time. This was in 2007, but at the time in 94, I got caught up in 95, the trial, especially the trial, I got caught up in uh, the drama of it, more so because I was in my own volatile relationship. So let's talk about, you know, like I said, all I can really do is show you the neighborhood. I think I'm going to walk through the alley, what OJ says. So OJ says that starting in 1992, although getting along well enough that Nicole suddenly suggested a separation, which he was very unhappy about. Uh, but she left Rockingham. She moved into Gretna Green, which I've also filmed for you. That's a, a house. She rented a house in Gretna Green several miles from here. Eventually, Cato Kalin moved in there with her. He had asked to come in. She had known him from uh, Aspen, where she had been dating his friend Grant. Both Grant and uh, Cato aspiring actors. Anyway, so Cato eventually moved into Gretna Green with Nicole and kind of helped take care of the kids, so on and so forth. Did his own thing, and then eventually he moved in, ironically enough, with OJ in one of OJ's bungalows on Rockingham. So, after the separation, it's a bad period for OJ. You know, he. He starts dating Paula Barbieri, starts going with Paula Barbieri, very infatuated, really likes her a lot. Uh, and then he, OJ claims that in early 1993, Nicole was really pushing him, pushing OJ for a reconciliation. And he got more and more confused. And then the more she pushed, the more he would give in to it. And then eventually they, she, that she started stalking him. She'd come by Rockingham, he claims. And then if she didn't see... Uh, Paula's Jeep parked out on the street. She would ring the bell to the gate. By the way, this is the alleyway right here in front of the condos where uh, OJ claims that he and the mysterious Charlie parked on the night of the murders and then went in through the gates, followed by Goldman. Anyway, so like I said, OJ claims that she was really pushing for a reconciliation and he started basically dating her and he was seeing. Paula at the same time that his bone of contention, OJ's always OJ's bone of contention was that he would have to come over occasionally, including the infamous 1993 9-1-1 tape because, and read her quote unquote riot act, is that she was hanging out, she, Nicole was hanging out with unsavory people so OJ claims that in 1993, again, they are seeing each other again. They're sleeping together again. They're with the kids again. Oh, he's going in. So now they have, look at that. It's a motorized driving gate. They don't even have those walk-in gates anymore that they had then. How interesting. Motorized lock walk-in ga uh, driving gates. So, OJ claims that they're, you know, having this relationship again. And that, oh, that, that Nicole is really, but she's, Nicole's going to therapy. She's trying to figure out where her anger, anger comes from. Her therapist is telling her that she's excited by anger and drama. She's trying to figure out where it comes from in her childhood. OJ is confused. He loves her. He still wants to be with her, but she is pushing to move back into Rockingham, which he is refusing. Uh, she wants to be a family again. Now, a lot of this is confirmed by Faye Resnick, who actually agrees with or will validate what OJ is saying here. As far as I know, OJ's family, though, says, no, 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 she never wanted to get back with him. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, actually. So, uh, OJ claims that, again, I should stop saying OJ claims because everything I'm saying is OJ claims. But in it, uh, if I did it, he's talking about the fact that Nicole wants to get back together. And he keeps pushing that they're not ready to get back together. And he really doesn't want to give up Paula either. 
So finally, after seeing both women for a while, OJ claims that he agrees with Nicole. He thinks it's a very strong relationship. They should give it one last try. And he agrees to go with Nicole. He tells Paula Barbieri over dinner. Paula is obviously upset and says she's not going to wait the year because OJ and Nicole have decided to give it a year together. And after a year, if everything's going well, she'll move back in with the kids into Rockingham. Now, OJ claims, again, I'm saying OJ claims, that Nicole was complaining after just a couple of months that she wants to break the year rule and move back into Rockingham. And it's inevitable, so why can't you just move back in? He's repeatedly telling her, no, we have a deal, it's got to be a year. The other thing that OJ is claiming is that when he's off, that they get along better when he's off. He's in New York doing his sports commentator and interviewing work. And when he comes back, it's, it's a fairly nice time But because they're not fighting. But he claims he's kind of walking around on eggshells still. I hope the traffic noise won't be too much for us. And I'm going to walk by the condos again. So he comes back. And then he gets the Naked Gun movie. And in 1993, he's filming the Naked Gun movie. And he claims that... Well, two things happened to him. Ron Shipman, husband of Cora Shipman, uh, Nicole's friend, good friend, is telling him that there's dicey things happening, including the fact that she slept with O.J.'s good friend, Marcus Allen. Now, O.J. claims that he knew about this already, that Nicole had confessed to that. I don't know how, if that's true or not. I don't know if he knew a year before the murders because knowing his violent temper, OJ's, or his temper, I don't see how they continued after he supposedly knew a year earlier she had slept with not only other guys, including Keith from Nezaluna, who, you know, he caught through the window at Gretna Green, but uh, but his friend, Mark, his friend Marcus Allen, sometimes competitive friend Marcus Allen, was definitely not as close as A.C. Cowan's was to him. They were childhood friends. So, when O.J. in late 1993 is doing, filming The Naked Gun, he claims that he gets into a conversation with a stand-in, a woman who's a stand-in for Anna Nicole Smith, who he also claims is a hooker. A hooker working for Heidi Fleiss. And if you're old enough to remember Heidi Fleiss and that whole thing, because they're all my generation and we're all around the same age, he claims she's working for Hollywood Fleiss, the Hollywood madam. So he claims that the prostitute working on Naked Gun says, you know, I've been partying with some of your wife's friends when you're out of town, Nicole's friends. And let me tell you, there's some hard people, man. And O.J. claims he kind of flies into a rage. He says, here's a prostitute telling me my wife, when I'm out of town, my wife who I've reconciled with, is hanging out with basically having drug-fueled orgies at Gretna Green, her rental house. She's still in a rental house because O.J. won't allow her to come back to to, uh, Rockingham. So that's when he goes and he apparently, according to O.J. again, says he goes and reads Nicole the Riot Act. How can you hang out with these, you know, these sketchy people in front of my kid? Everything is the kids. He's concerned about the children and that she's hanging out with all these sketchy people, these druggies, around his children. Well, he claims they have an argument and he leaves and that he goes back to Rockingham and that as soon as he's walking in the door, Nicole's repeatedly calling the landline at Rockingham and asking him to come back to Gretna Green and finish the discussion. Don't be upset. I just want to talk about it. So OJ claims that he goes back to Gretna Green, and then when he gets there, she suddenly flips out with in fear, locks the door, and starts and calls 911. And that that's the 911 tape with him almost breaking down the door, breaking down the door. But OJ claims that he was invited back to finish the conversation, and that she suddenly got scared of him. And called 911. But the relationship kept going. So they get over that. He also is yelling about he really hates that she's still hanging out with Keith. 
Now, Keith is the guy from Mezzaluna that she was giving oral sex to on the couch in the living room of Gretna Green when O.J. came back that night, having seen Nicole that day, thinking he's going to stop by and they're going to have a little something-something that night. And he looks through the window and he catches her with Keith. I mean, the drama, it was really bad. In fact, I think, not only do I think, I know that in retrospect, it was a bad thing that they lived so close. I mean, at least on Bundy, he'd have to go through gates and come up to the front of the condo to look through the windows. I don't even know if that was possible here on Bundy. But on Gretna Green, he could certainly walk up to her house and spy through her window anytime he wanted to. Bad idea. So O.J. claims that he convinces Nicole to buy the Bundy condo instead because her lease was coming due on uh, Gretna Green. So she buys the bon Bundy condo, and he says, if you move back into Rockingham with me after our year, then you can rent it out, you know, use it as a rental property, an investment. But in that time, things are going to He's spending time out of town doing his business. She's in town. She's partying with these other people. He's furious about it. He wants to protect the kids. And eventually, as 1994 rolls along, they can't resolve their issues. They obviously don't move back in together. He, I believe, now there are rumors, I believe... And I don't know this, obviously nobody knows any of this for sure, but the rumors is she was sleeping with Marcus Allen again and O.J. hit the roof. And that she wanted to, when she supposedly told O.J., she wanted to lie to the IRS and tell them that the Bundy condo was a rental. She was living at Rockingham to avoid paying the taxes on it, and he hit the roof over that. So, by 1994, as we know, by the spring and summer, finally... Nicole has apparently given up on the reconciliation. She's furious at O.J. O.J. is back seeing Paula Barbieri. And on that infamous June 12th night, he had had a fight with Paula. He was mad in a bad mood. He was exhausted. He didn't want to go to the recital, but he promised he would. He ignored Nicole at the recital. O uh, Cato had moved in with him by then. He was upset that she was wearing such a short skirt. He said she was looking like a hooker, you know, trying to look a lot younger than age 36, so on and so forth. And this is where it really gets tricky. OJ says that he's stirred up by a guy named Charlie. He says he's packing for... OJ says that he is packing for his flight to Chicago for that Hertz event. And he says that O.J., O.J., excuse me, he says that Charlie, who had recently met, comes and stops by and basically stirs him up. Charlie says, this is in O.J.'s hypothetical, and, and if I did it, he says, Charlie says, look, I was just some guys having dinner in Santa Monica tonight, which is close by, and then the guys told me that Nicole is, you know, having wild parties over there. And this Faye Resnick, her friend, new friend, is a, is a, a doper, a cokehead. In fact, Faye did go to, um, was at that time actually, in, in a rehab, Promises in Malibu, which is like a celebrity rehab place. And that there's a lot of bad stuff going on over there. Well, of course, this is the wrong thing to tell OJ. So OJ, in his hypothetical, says he flips out. He says with Charlie, he invites Charlie along. Charlie doesn't know where he's, where they're going. He says, we're going to read, I'm going to read her the riot act and scare the shit out of her. She can't be doing this to me, especially with my kids there. I've told her numerous times. She's hanging out with lowlifes and inviting them around my kids and God knows what they're up to. Of course, OJ never talks about his own cocaine use uh, and his partying. But anyway, so... O.J. claims, you know, he has the black, the the, the, steak, the the beanie and the gloves, and he takes the knife out of his car. Charlie doesn't know what's happening at this point. He says he goes through the broken gate, which I'll show you again in the alley, which is not a gate anymore. And O.J. claims that just as he 
and he claims he kept a, a knife in the car for the crazies of LA. It says he couldn't carry a gun to keep them away, but you can you can carry a knife. So he came, claims that he, he, he actually, he, he, excuse me, he claims he left the knife in the car, but he was all in black. Then he claims that just as he comes through the gate that I just showed you, which used to be the gate in the alley, that Goldman shows up and he says Goldman shows up and, and freezes like shocked to see OJ and, and scared already. And he says that, understandably, <laughs> OJ flips out. Who are you? What are you doing here? What's in the envelope? Is that dope? You bringing dope to my wife? You fucking my wife? And that Goldman says, I'm just bringing glasses. Juditha left them or Judy left them at my restaurant. I'm a waiter there. OJ says, oh, you're on first name basis with Judy. You know her so well. Huh? And he's getting more and more steamed. And that Goldman says, there's nothing going on. I'm just bringing the glasses back and then I'm going home. And, of course, O.J. says he doesn't believe it. He says, Nicole's got all the candles lit. She's waiting for somebody, and it, I bet it's your ass. And he can't convince him. Goldman can't convince him otherwise. So O.J. says at that point he comes out. Excuse me. He says Nicole comes out, and she's, you know, what are you doing here? How dare you? This is my house. There's nothing going on with me and Goldman. And even if there was, it's my business, so on and so forth. And... that Goldman's starting to get protective of Nicole. Now, here's where it gets hairy. The coroner said that Nicole was hit on the head with the butt of the knife. OJ says that Nicole started coming at him with hands and fists, feet and hands flying, and she's coming at him aggressively and fighting with him, and that she slips and falls and hits her head and passes out. And basically, at that point, he says that Goldman goes into the karate stance to which OJ says, he said, oh, you think you can kick my ass with that karate or whatever you are? You think you're, you think you're a tough guy? I'll kick your ass, blah, blah, blah. And he says that Goldman starts circling him in the, in the karate stance. Well, that's the point where OJ says he blacks out. He doesn't remember anything, but when he comes to, oh, and by this, by this time, excuse me, I skipped something. He says that, at some point when Nicole had come back out on the, in her front patio, that that's where Charlie came in the gate and the Goldman was then kind of trapped between Charlie and OJ. He couldn't go forward to the front patio and he couldn't go, uh, couldn't go back to the, and leave to the back patio. And that Charlie had brought the knife and somehow OJ doesn't remember what happened after that other than he must have gotten a hold of the knife because he said he was covered in blood and that he changed all his clothes except for his socks in the Bronco and told Charlie once they got by, a stunned and hysterical Charlie that once he got back to Rockingham he had to go between the tennis courts between the neighbor's house and his house which he had done before and he claims he did and he got back into the house and he had to prepare for Alan Park the limo driver to come pick him up he was going to take a shower so on and so forth that would be I guess why the bloody socks were found he must have forgotten about them or he didn't think they were bloody anyway as we know there are no second set as far as i know of of of, uh, of uh, sh bloody shoe prints at the location just those bruno magli uh shoe prints which uh, oj owned a pair of bruno magli shoes anyway that's what oj claims happened and that he in a stunned state of mind went off to chicago Slept on the plane, fell asleep in the room. Detectives called him, says she was, your ex-wife has been killed. You need to come back to LA. He now claims he threw the glass, even though in the deposition, he said that he doesn't know how the glass got broken and cut his finger. But that he was signing autographs before that, and a guy on the plane was looking at his class ring and would have noticed if he had a cut, which he claims he didn't. That's it, folks. Now that's OJ's words in If I Did It. So anyway, this is a little long, but I think it was worth it because it's absolutely, absolutely fascinating. We know what happened from there. All right, guys, I want to end it there. What are we at? 25 minutes. Thank you for watching. Fascinating subject. I can't get enough of it. And obviously, 
a lot of other people can't get enough of it as well. All right, guys. So please, uh, you know, as you know, I did all this off the top of my head. No notes. So uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot to remember. So please like the channel and subscribe if you haven't already. My name is Ron, and I love you, and I'll talk to you at a, at a later date. Bye.